here in this video, so you know we're just gonna get over that now. Um, my name is Chris. I gotta fix my cushion. I have this chair. It's an old, old chair. It's not comfortable at all. It's an outdoor chair, and I have a um, a cushion on it. <laughs> it's this cushion I bought that people who uh, go in wheelchairs get it and it's real comfortable. It looks like that purple grid. Um, you know, you've seen the, the commercials for that, how it got it. It looks like the exact same thing, except it's not purple. Um, no endorsement. But it's it's the same kind of thing. Very comfortable. I've had it for, I don't know, eight years? I used to sit on the floor a lot and play video games. So my butt kept getting sore. Anywho, before we get started... We have to talk about the the YouTube gathering that came together, the uh, YouTube community. Sorry, I had to get something. It's a piece of plastic. Sorry. Um, YouTube community got together, and they had a just an honorary fish fry, and it was. Uh, it was really cool they got everything going and somehow the food hadn't arrived and then when it did it ended up being several gigantic live op uh, octopus and they just started grabbing people and eating them whole and I was like I'm just gonna go home you know so went to the car and I just remember little Petey came up and he was like my mom and dad have been eating help me I was like, you got it, kid. Stand out there in the road. He did. And I drove right over him. So, that's for you, Meg. And this is her, her, her request. The case of Drew Peterson. And you know, I kept thinking of the other guy. The hell is going on over there? I don't know. I don't remember what I was saying. The other guy, Peterson, whatever his name was. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. I'm going to be eating some chips and salsa, but I'm going to turn the, the mic off when I do. So if you see me snacking, you're going to get over it because I really just wanted to eat some chips and guacamole. So there you go. It, it's going to happen. It is what it is. By the way, I would just like to say that this is video number 99 and video 100 will be another video I haven't figured out what I want to do for 100 if I was gonna do a story time I don't I doubt it because I have a lot of videos that I want to catch up on so it won't be so I don't know why I said it look like subscribe let's just get into the video hey you and welcome my name is Mike and in this old slash new video. We're going to take a trip to the wonderful town of Bolingbroke, Illinois. Makes a change from Florida, Texas, and Canada, I suppose. Now, the name Peterson, it's kind of like one of those names that just keeps coming up. And here we have another, a boy named Drew. Now, what a... he's probably, like, out of all the characters we've talked about, one of the most interesting. Kind of funny, charismatic, and not great. Drew loved being married four times, you know, he was it's quite a guy, quite a character. But he loved media attention even more. Over the decades, Sarge, as he'd be known in his later years, probably by just me, well, he'd become a bit of a household name. This one's really about power struggles in a way. There's a lot in it, it's set over many years, so let's start telling it over many minutes. At least 30. Scott Peterson, that's who I'm thinking of. I was just going to look it up, and it just popped into my head. Scott Peterson. He's the guy who murdered his wife, right? Wasn't she pregnant? I don't know much about that story either. Maybe I'll do that one next. No, I'm not going to do that one next. That's not going to be 100. Eh, it might be. Who knows? It's, who cares? It's just 100. You know what? Maybe it is 100, but I don't say it's 100. I say it's 101. And then the 100th episode could be like, 
the 121st episode, but I declare it's the 100th episode. I don't know what I'm saying or why I keep talking to you. I'm just gonna, just gonna get back into it. Our boy Drew was born in 1954 in Bolingbrook, Illinois. He was the eldest child with two other siblings. His father was a Marine and their family was run pretty strict. At the ripe old- Maiden wants to say hi with her haircut and get a stomach rub. Feel good now? Was that your stomach that just growled? You're not getting any of this guacamole, you know that, right? Oh, she's a good one. At the age of 17, Drew got himself a pilot's license, which, you know, back then, as it is now, would be quite expensive. But his family, you know, they spared no expense for this guy. Maybe Drew was gonna go fly in the military. He didn't, but he did go to the military. Before he got in, he started dating his high school sweetheart, Carol Brown. They were serious, got married when Carol was 17 years old. I gotta put so, you down. Drew joined the army, was an MP in 1974, but he was honorably discharged in 1976. After which, the couple moved back to Bolingbrook, Illinois, where Drew became a cop on the mean streets. He was ready for anything. Hey, looky see, come on. If that tash says anything, it says don't mess with me or I'll have your ass. Drew and Carol would have not one, but two kids together. In 1978, Drew became a frickin' narc man and he became an undercover cop. He even looked quite the part. Doesn't get much more stereotypical than that. In 1980, Carol, Carol, she filed for divorce. Why, you ask? He had a great mustache, come on. I hear you're barking, big dog. Well, it turned out that Drew like, liked to um, stick his pew in other ladies' cues. See, he'd be off, you know, bragging to all the other lads about how easy it was to get chicks when you're a cop in the 70s. Carol just um, didn't understand. You know, which from Drew's perspective would have been her problem, really. Carol, she got custody of the children. Drew got visitation rights, but that would be the end of that marriage. One down, three to go. I just figured he killed her. <laughs> In 1981, Drew met Kyle Peary. Drew, at 27, was seven years older. He charmed the pants off her, literally, and everything seemed to be going great. He had a good job, and you know, even though Kyle Perry was underage, she could, he could get her into bars. Not a problem. Wait. What? A, a police officer breaking the rules they're supposed to enforce? Well, this is the first time I'm hearing about something like this. However, unsurprisingly, as I'm making this video, Drew had a dark side. He would want to know Kyle's every move. He would follow her. He would drive by her place so he knew where she was, and to check she wasn't lying. He would interrogate her about I just want to say this. A lot of times, when someone is paranoid, let me move the mouse, apologies. When someone is paranoid that their significant other is cheating on them and they're doing everything they can to, um, to track them, to stalk them in some weird way, I have found it's never personally with me, but I've found that typically the person who doesn't trust the other one because they think that person's always cheating, typically is cheating. And it's like they're so paranoid that that person could be doing something to hurt their feelings, but they don't care what they're doing to the other person. I could be wrong overall, but I've seen it happen two times in, in my family and two, two times with, with friends that I know. Now, 
there's a lot of people. Yeah, but yeah, I've I've no three times. So typically, if someone is that paranoid, it's because they themselves are doing something. Just saying. Where she went when she wasn't with him. Hey, leave it at the office, pal. Kyle eventually wanted to call off the relationship. Drew didn't take that very well, and things got a little bit physical. You know, this would end with Kyle calling the police, though, as Drew was a police officer, who would show up? What is but the lads from the station? Uh, how are you, Drew? What's the crack? So as you can imagine, not really much happened. So Drew and Kyle were no longer a thing. I mean, in Kyle's mind at least. See, Kyle Peary would have to go to court. Because what Drew was doing, now that she had left him, was, he, was him and the boys would write uh, parking tickets for her. But they wouldn't leave them on her car. So she was just... So she had parking tickets just building up and building up oh, that she had no idea about until eventually a warrant was issued for her arrest. What a scumbag. Guess who the officer who arrested her was. If she brought it to court, it would, it would be dropped. But um, Drew wanted to make sure that she, everybody else knew, who was wearing the badge in this town. And Drew found a new plaything, 23-year-old Vicky Connolly. They met in a bar. Drew was interested in her right away. She was a 10, but she was still married in the eyes of the law when Drew met her. But she was in the process of getting a divorce. As things were a bit messy for her at the time, she told Drew, I'll take a rain check. Not really a good time for me to, to you know, get into something new. Drew, as you can imagine, did not take no for an answer and hounded her, hounded her, until she eventually relented. As soon as her divorce was finalized, Drew and Vicky married. But the honeymoon stage... He did not look happy in that photo. ...didn't last long. See, Drew, well, he's a real piece of shit. We knew that already. He got into trouble in the narc department. He was fired from the unit after being accused of taking bribes and also dealing the drugs he was supposed to be seizing. Of course. He got busted down to patrol PC Plod. The demo You mean he should have been fired? Imagine if I got caught selling drugs on the street and I was like, no, 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 it's fine. These are cop drugs. They'd be like, oh, well, in that case, it's a $10 just jaywalking ticket. No, you fire that guy. What the f are they thinking? I self-censored myself. I'm trying hard on that. You pieces it so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you know, the, it, I mean, it was the 80s. Came with a demoted paycheck and Vicky and Drew would have to move out of their house to a smaller home. However, before the shit hit the fan, the couple bought a bar together, called Sud's Bar, which they still held on to. Drew did not take the demotion well. He started to become even more controlling, aggressive, verbally and physically abusive. Even one time pulling a gun on Vicky, telling her he could kill her and make it look like an accident. This guy, um, he's a winner so far, I mean. And Drew, following his Peter, son, found a new woman, Kathleen Savio. He would tell Kathleen all about Vicky, that they were married, though he was able to tell the story from a certain point of view. He told Kathleen that Vicky was a junkie, and he wanted to file for divorce as he couldn't take it anymore. So Drew and Kathleen, you know, they began seeing each other, and when Vicky found out... What world is this guy living in? What the hell? Uh, she began to file for divorce, although, as we've seen with Kyle Peary, well... We're not done yet. One night, when Vicky was heading home from the bar, Suds, that she co-owned with Drew, she got into an accident. Someone cut the brakes on her car and she flipped multiple times. Very nearly died. She was in a coma for over a week and needed reconstructive surgery.
when she woke up. Well, now Drew owned the bar by himself and he had a divorce. So now, Kathleen. She grew up in not great circumstances. Her stepdad was a deadbeat, her biological dad didn't pay child support, and her and her siblings would leave home at an early age. She would go on to become an accountant and wanted all the things she didn't have when she was growing up. A house, family, money, security. And she thought she found them when she met Drew Peterson on a blind date. They got married in 1992. And to absolutely no one's surprise, well, uh, maybe Kathleen's, things went down the toilet pretty quickly. One year after they married, Kathleen was even hospitalized, Drew beat her so bad. Though it was one of those, I fell down the stairs type deals. Though it would be almost 10 years into their marriage that things would finally come to a head. In October 2001, Kathleen received an anonymous letter. In the letter, she was told that Drew was having an affair with a 17-year-old, Stacy. Drew was 47 years old at the time. This time, it was Drew who filed for divorce. The divorce was crazy. Police were involved many times due to violence coming from the home. Once again, as soon as the divorce was finalized, Drew got married. Stacy was only 19 at the time, and soon she was pregnant. And Drew and Stacy would live just two blocks away from Kathleen. And, as we have seen many times before, he continued to intimidate and harass Kathleen. They had two kids together, so they saw each other regularly. And Drew would still be physically abusive toward her, though Kathleen would be the one to get in trouble. In 2002, Kathleen asked for an emergency order of protection. She was afraid for her life, even telling her sister, he's gonna kill me and he'll make it look like an accident. She was hopeless. Drew, Drew was the police. Kathleen reported to police that one night, Drew broke into her home with a knife. Kathleen basically just said to him, do it, just get it over with. Drew, he pulled the knife, put it to her head, but said he couldn't do it, and he left. She reported that to the police, right? But Drew, Drew, he had his own version of events, which were quite different. He said that, you know, she invited him over. He uh, opened the door, and who was standing there? Kathleen, you know, maybe uh, taking, out, uh, taking off her clothes, you know, shaking her boobs, asking him if he missed anything. So, nothing happened. Kathleen then wrote to the state attorney. He knows how to manipulate the system, and his next step is to take my children away or kill me instead. I'm asking for your help now, before it's too late. Her letter was ignored, and Kathleen was ignored. In early 2004, a property settlement right was scheduled between Kathleen and Drew. Kathleen didn't make it that long. In 2004, she was found dead, face down in an empty bathtub, with a gash on her scalp and her hair wet. Now the way Kathleen was found was interesting. So the day before she was found, it was a Sunday, so the weekend, Drew had the kids. That evening, you know, Drew was going to drop the kids back to Kathleen's house for the week. However, when he rocked up, he got no answer knocking on the door. He then took the children back to his house, thinking, you know, she was out and about, he'd go back later on that day to drop off the kids. Popped back again, knocked away in the door again, got no answer again, took the kids back for another night. Pop by again, you know, the next morning. She, Kathleen, she's God knows where, you know. In a bathtub, maybe? He tried calling her the next morning, but got no answer. So, on the 1st of March 2004, he decided to call Kathleen's neighbours in case they heard from her. They said they hadn't seen her in two days, and he asked them to accompany him going inside Kathleen's home to check if everything was okay. It was the neighbours who found Kathleen face down in an empty bathtub. She had bruises on the front of her body, a gash on her scalp, a scrape on her back, but the coroner stated she had no defensive wounds. 
There was also no sign of forced entry. And the coroner said, you know, due to the, she, she more likely slipped, banged her head and drowned in the bathtub. An empty bathtub. So Kathleen's death was ruled an accident. The next day, Drew was called in for an interview, but as you can imagine, it was not really, you know, too official. It was more like a talk between buddies, you know, sharing a few beers, whatever. The investigating officer was a good friend of Drew's. Drew explained he spent his free time during the weekend at home in the company of his children and Stacy. Police called Stacy in for an interview as well, but funny thing is, Drew told his buddies, you know, he'll sit in on Stacy's interview. Stacy was heavily pregnant at the time, and he wanted to make sure she was okay. So sweet. Stacy gave Drew an alibi for the night of Kathleen's death. She stated that they were together the entire night. I'm sure he was staring at her with those Manson lamps the entire time. Two weeks after the accident, Drew provided a handwritten will of Kathleen and himself, stating, you know, it stated that, you know, if anything happened to one of them, the other one gets all their shit. Funny thing is, previously, you know, during the divorce process, it was stated that no such will existed. <laughs> Lucky for Drew, right? I know. Drew got full custody of the kids, and Stacy legally adopted them as well. And Drew and Stacy's marriage was soon in the shitter itself. He constantly needed to know where she was. He was verbally abusive. The usual. And in 2007, after contacting a divorce attorney, she disappeared. On the morning of the 28th of October, 2007, Stacy. I'm starting to believe this guy is not a good person. She decided to head over to her sister's place to help her with some home renovation, some painting. But she never arrived. Why? Well, you know, allegedly, 23 year old Stacy. She took off with another fella. I know, right? She had taken her passport, a bikini, and a few thousand dollars in cash. It was her sister who filed the missing persons report. Those who knew her said she would never leave her children behind. However, Drew said, you know, yeah, yeah. The day she disappeared, she called me. She, she called me and she told me what she was doing. She said she was running off with another guy, she left her car at the airport and she told me where her car was. I went off, picked up her car, and drove it back home, you know, before she was reported missing. But she's fine, really, she's out there, living the high life, you know? So for Drew, it's just, uh, yeah. tough shit, you know? <clears throat> this is Chicago's very own WGN News at Noon. WGN. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Negevin. And I'm Micah Mater. We begin our coverage this noon in Bolingbroke, where WGN's Robert Jordan has been following the Peterson case. Hi, Bob. Hi, Micah. Well, police here in Bolingbroke are assisting the Illinois State Police in trying to locate the missing woman. 23-year-old Stacy Ann Peterson is the wife of a patrol sergeant here with the Bolingbroke Police Department. And family members say that she hasn't been heard from since last Sunday. Since Stacy Ann Peterson is married to a Bolingbroke Police Sergeant, Drew Peterson, the Bolingbroke Police Department decided it would be best if the Illinois State Police handled the investigation. The disappearance of Stacy Peterson has stunned family members who have not heard from her since October 28. He was questioned in relation to the disappearance. He referred to Stacy in the past tense and refused to allow police to search his home. This got a fair bit of attention, which he lapped up. Please go home. Please leave me alone. Please don't get involved in my little world. <laughs> I've talked to you before, so uh, I got kids in the car, you morons. So. We're not shooting the kids. I'll, I'll talk to you another time. Folks, this is the holiday season. I know at least five families that are losing their homes that are in this area. You probably should put a, maybe a little bit of effort into saving these people and their families or reaching out to your fellow man. If someone needs a shoulder to cry on or they need a meal for their families, you guys should be maybe putting a little more effort into doing that rather than harassing my family. Uh, folks have a good day. I'm still in love with Stacy, and I miss her, so. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Drew. But the investigation was not over. That's when Thomas Morphe, it's spelled like this. 
Drew Peterson's uh, stepbrother, he entered the picture. Bear with me, if you wouldn't mind, uh, as we go through this. Now, Thomas was questioned by police while he was in hospital. He was in hospital because he tried, he tried killing himself. Now, why did he try to take his own life? Hmm. On the 27th of October, the day before Stacy disappeared, Drew started to discuss his relationship with Stacy. He told Thomas that Stacy was cheating on him and he had to take care of this problem. He asked Thomas if he loves him enough to kill for him. Thomas said, no. Drew then asked if Thomas could live with knowing about it. Thomas said he could, as he had a feeling that Drew killed Kathleen. Drew then drove them to a storage rental place and asked Thomas to rent a unit for him. In return, he would give him $2,000. However, Thomas couldn't rent a unit in the end, he needed ID. A few hours later, Thomas called Drew and said he couldn't be involved in this plan, whatever it was, wink wink. Drew said he could respect that. Then, the next day on the 28th of October, Drew showed up at Thomas's home. They went for a drive and Drew handed Thomas a cell phone, instructing him not to answer it. 45 minutes later, the phone rang twice, the caller ID saying, Stacy. Then they drove to Drew's house, where Drew pushed a blue barrel out of his bedroom. Thomas then helped Drew to carry the barrel down the stairs, out of the house and into the car. And Drew then gave Thomas some money. Drew then drove him home and told him this never happened. Thomas then tried to kill himself after, well, after realizing he helped Drew get rid of something. Thomas was offered an immunity deal. Drew Peterson denies reports that a relative helped him move a container that held his missing wife's body. Julian Cruz is in Bolingbrook with the latest details. Julian? Robin, startling new revelations about this mysterious container, a container that has clearly become the focus of this sensational missing persons case. All this as suspect Drew Peterson continues his sometimes bizarre long-running dialogue with the media. What's going on today? What's going on today? Yes. We went to McDonald's. Okay. We had Happy Meals and McRib sandwiches. How's that? <laughs> and that's what's going on today. What I want to talk about is I'm going to come camp myself in front of your house and see if you like it. If he feels pressure from all the scrutiny, it's hard to tell. At times joking, smiling, even laughing with reporters, you almost get the feeling that Drew Peterson is somehow enjoying the attention. Officially, however, he is considered a suspect in the sudden disappearance of his fourth wife, Stacy Peterson. The former Bolingbrook police sergeant came out of his house yesterday with a home video camera walking around the small army of TV news trucks and personnel virtually camped out in front of his Bolingbrook home. This bizarre spectacle amid reports that one of his relatives tried to commit suicide just days after allegedly helping Drew remove a large blue container from Drew's bedroom the day after Stacy Peterson disappeared. The Chicago Tribune reports that their relatives said the mysterious container was warm to the touch. But late last night, our own Julie Unruh confronted Peterson about the container and the allegation that the container may have had the body of Stacy Peterson. A relative of yours saying you helped carry a rectangular container out of your home on October 28th. I have no idea what anybody's talking about like that. Warm to the touch. No. Nope. He says he believes that he helped you dispose of your wife's body. Nope. Can you at least respond to that? No. Nope. He's, he's guilty, by the way. He chews his gum. Anybody chews their gum like that is an asshole and probably a murderer. <laughs> oh, I hate those people. I chew gum all the time. I When I head to work, 7 a.m., I pop in three pieces of sugar-free Wrigley Spearmint gum. No, Wrigley Double Mint. And I'll chew it until I'm done with work. But you, you could sometimes you don't even know I'm chewing it because it's just. Sometimes they even squirrel it away inside, right there, right there, and pull it out. But if you ever see me going. 
By all means, if you see me in the street, hit me with the vehicle. And yes, I said vehicle. Not at all. No response. Talk to my lawyer. I've got nothing to no say about it. No truth to it whatsoever. None. Nobody helped me with anything. Such a manner. On October 28th, where were you on October 28th? This gentleman says he helped you carry a container out of your home. Uh, you're going to have to talk to my attorney. Okay. Have a good day. Peterson's denial comes as law enforcement intensifies the search for the missing container. Volunteers searching for Stacy Peterson say they've been told by state police to look for this possibly blue container. See, the way the winds were blowing, Drew decided it would be best to lawyer up. He got himself a defense attorney named Joel Brodsky. As it turned out, his lawyer was more of um, his publicist than anything else. The two actually made a contract in which Joel was to get money out of each and all of his and or Drew's interviews and other media coverage. Might as well make a bit of kibosh to, uh, you know, out of the newspapers and media. Wanting to know if you, uh, killed your wife. I want you to be 100% honest with me, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, no, I'm gonna lie to you. <laughs> I want you to be 100% honest, okay. seriously. Did you kill your wife, Stacy? No. No question at all in your mind? No question at all in my mind. What about your wife, Kathy? No. Did you have anything to do with the death of Kathy? Nothing. Why are you talking? Because it's a, I know there are a lot of people who are gonna be watching this saying, what was he thinking? Like, why do you think it's important to talk? I'm really being portrayed as a monster here and nobody's defending me. Mm -hmm. Nobody's stepping up and saying no. I don't think anyone's portraying you that way. You are just by everything you've done. Sir. He's a decent guy, he helps people, he does this, he does that. So somebody's gotta say something. Someone said either you're guilty of both of these or you have the worst luck in the world. You, think? you just happen you to think? marry two women, one is missing and one who's dead. Correct. Which is it, you just have bad luck? I guess this is bad luck. A week and a half after Stacy's disappearance, police ruled that they believed Stacy was the victim of foul play. And so, gradually more and more information started to come out. Neighbors told the police they had seen two men carrying a blue barrel out of the house. Drew's exes came forward, telling the police what kind of man he is. With all the information police gathered, they decided there was another case they had to look into. As there was no hard evidence regarding what happened to Stacy, they hoped to find results regarding the death of Kathleen Savio. So while searches were made to find Stacy, Kathleen's body was exhumed and re-examined. Two different pathologists were involved, and they disagreed with the original coroner's findings. Because of the bruises and abrasions to her body and the way in which her body was positioned in the tub, they determined the manner of her death was homicide. And last week, his third wife's death was ruled not an accident, but a homicide. Drew Peterson is with us this morning, along with his attorney, Joel Brodsky. Gentlemen, good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. So since you were here three months ago, when Stacy was missing for one month, now she hasn't been seen of or heard from in four months. And this big development, Drew, was this issue last week where a coroner's report after an autopsy now rules that your third wife, Kathleen Savio, died not of an accident, but of homicide. Considering that you were already under the magnifying glass, how did you greet that news? It was kind of shocking. Uh, we believed for the last four years that uh, her death was accidental, and then all of a sudden, that was with the fresh autopsy. Now all of a sudden, there's new autopsy uh, with an old body, let's say, and it's been ruled a homicide. I'm kind of suspicious of it. You don't think that the coroner's report is accurate? I'm not sure. I think it needs to be scrutinized and looked at a little closer. And this happened. You know what you should do? You should have a win a date with Drew contest. Oh, I'll do a dating game with you. Drew? Oh, me. It's up to you, man. I don't know. Ask, ask the lawyer. Yeah, <clears throat> why not? Could being the right caller get you a date with Drew Peterson? Police say the former suburban Chicago police officer is a suspect in the disappearance of his wife, Stacy. But that didn't stop his attorney from suggesting the promotion to radio station WJMKF. I think that's not even funny. Win a date with the murderer. 
FM, and host Steve Dahl reportedly thought it was a great idea. But the station's vice president says no way. He says win a date with Trump. I would rather return glasses to a woman who happened to be the ex of O.J. Simpson. Drew will not happen on the station. Peterson's attorney, Joel Brodsky, says his client didn't do anything wrong and is entitled to have some fun. Stacy Peterson has been missing since October, and Drew insists she ran off with another man and is still alive. The search for the missing mother of two has drawn national attention. Shockingly and, frankly, disappointingly, never came to pass. And on April 1st, 2009, Drew decided to call a local radio station. Where's Drew? We got him, Drew. Drew Peterson. He finally picked up. I'm here. All right, buddy. Well, you called us. What's going on? Uh, I've just been on the phone with uh, my attorney, Joel Bratsky, for the last half hour. And he's telling me just to keep my mouth shut and sit tight, but i got to come clean with this. Um, I wanted to do it with you. Is that okay with you? Well, I don't know what you're going to say. Oh. Well, this is hard, man. Kyle, this is hard. Well, I, I mean, what, what are you, what are you going to do here? Well, I just got to tell you, it's been weighing heavy on my chest for some time now, and I just got to say, he's not going to. That the chicken wings at Dixon Bar and Grill are the best I've ever <clears throat> had. Ten twenty-three West Lake. Happy April Fool's Day, man, Kyle. <laughs> What a great, you know, April Fool's Day plan Drew and Joel had. Uh, by the way, that uh, that chicken wing place, you know, that Drew mentioned in his confession, that restaurant was owned by Joel Brodsky. Yeah, so they were really just milking this for all it's worth. It's, it's fantastic. Love to see it. You seem so upbeat. Uh, how do you manage to stay so upbeat, uh, given the fact that your wife's been missing for three months? Oh, it's just, you know, you do what you can. You know, I'm not going to go hide in the corner and cry about it. You know, it's just like I personally uh, grieve over it. Uh, uh, but I do that all on my own. The, the neighbors said that they saw you carrying out a, a big blue barrel that would be big again, enough. Again, again, Shepard, that's not what we agreed to talk about. You know, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't agree to any, any restrictions the, uh, on conversation. I would never do that. I, I, just, I just wonder what... Okay, well, then, then I guess i got to walk away. Have a good day, Mr. Shepard. It was nice talking to you. Well, he'll talk about the dating me, game, mm -mm. but he won't talk about the fact that the neighbors me. that the neighbors say they saw him with a large 55-gallon blue barrel uh, carrying it out with someone else, uh, and shortly after his wife went missing, have a good day, guys. Yeah. his fourth wife went missing, his third wife died in a dry bathtub. Finally, on May 7, 2009, Drew Peterson was indicted and arrested for the murder of Kathleen Savio. Turn around, move, move back for your own safety, move back. Get on the sidewalk. So as we already know, this case is cuckoo pants. So why would the trial be any different? Well, it turns out that in the weeks before her disappearance, Stacy told at least three people that she believed her husband Drew was responsible for what happened to his third wife, that he killed her, murdered her. Drew asked the judge to exclude testimony from Stacy's pastor and the divorce lawyer. Stacy had told them both Drew killed Kathleen. Drew asked the judge to exclude them since neither was available to testify to those facts themselves. The judge ruled against Drew and so a law got dubbed Drew's Law, which allows a judge to admit hearsay statements if a prosecutor can prove a defendant may have killed a witness to prevent them from testifying. On September 6th, 2012, Drew was found guilty of premeditated murder. On February 21st, 2013, Drew Peterson was sentenced to 38 years in prison. 38, that's all? 
he was incarcerated at Menard Correctional Center in Chester, Illinois. Later, he was moved to the Federal Correctional Institution, Terre Haute. Within a month, he was attacked by another prisoner, who hoped to sell his belongings on eBay to some true crime aficionados. Good. But the story doesn't end there. See, there's another twist. And that would be... Drew, P Drew Peterson's, um... Solicitation... For murder. Yeah. One inmate said he was playing basketball in the prison yard in October 2013, when Drew approached him asking for a favor. The inmate said Drew asked him to get someone to kill James Glasgow. James Glasgow was the state's attorney who put him away. Hold on. Tell what you say. Just the green light. Basically, go ahead and kill him. All right. That's what you wanted, right? <laughs> it ain't no, ain't no turning back. Okay. All right. So the first time we talked about it, it was, huh? The first time we talked about it, there was no turning back. All right. All right. If I get some booze in here, we'll celebrate. Hey, stop. Right down there. <laughs> but the first thing they will identify him is the guy that got me. That's what he's known for. That's what he'll. That's the, the guy that runs it. Give Drew Peterson. Drew told this inmate his appeal would be nearly guaranteed to succeed if James was out of the picture, and the prosecutor's assistants wouldn't have the guts to charge him with Stacy's disappearance. Yes, they Last would. <clears throat> dead by Christmas. When would that put you out? Approximately, like, what do you think? Are you worried about his ADAs or anything? No. He'll never let me alone. If I get out, he's gonna charge me with Stacy. If you get out, he's gonna charge you with what? Right. Yeah. Even though they don't, they don't, they don't have grounds for that, but they didn't have grounds for this other thing. Okay, so they got you on Kathleen. Yeah. I thought they got you on Stacy. No. Stacy's still alive, running around out there. Drew got another forty years for that. Where he remains to this day. Where Stacy is. We don't know. Drew has never been charged in connection with- Hold on. He got 38 years for actual murder and 40 years for trying to set up a murder? I'm sorry. When is the attempted murder worse than the murder? And this is in Illinois. What the hell? Um, with her disappearance. Stacy's sister is still trying to find her. She says Drew disposed of her sister's body in a canal. She actually has sonar pictures of what she believes are Stacy's remains and has a GoFundMe set up to bring her home. Though the police aren't really helping her for some reason. Maybe they don't think it's credible, but, but who knows. And so ends the story of Drew Peterson to, to date. I mean, because this story is so batshit, wouldn't surprise me if uh, more craziness were to emerge. I mean, it's a lot to wrap your head around. He was a busy guy. It's very much a story about the abuse of power. Drew thought he could do whatever he wanted while now in prison. Hey, <laughs> can't do so much anymore. Surrounded by killers, couldn't even organize a murder. Thank you so much for watching. I really do. I don't want to shock anyone here, but I didn't know anything about this. Nothing. But watching the WGN clips, it remind. I think I have video 100. Video 100? Video 100. I think I might show you guys some old... When I was a kid, I was a big fan of... I mean, obviously Winnie the Pooh, duh. But I was a big fan, and I don't know if this is nationwide or what. I'm sure. May I don't. I don't I, you know what? I don't know. I grew up watching Bozo the Clown. If you don't know who that is, Bozo, and then there was there was the the helper Cookie, and Bozo the Clown 
it was like a kid's show and there were kids in the audience and you would have a kid come up for various games and they all got to win cookies um oh my gosh what were the cookies oh i gotta look into it i'm sure i'll see it but one of them was um you had to eat you know 10 crackers and then whistle um then they had the other one the ping pong game um and you had to throw a, a ping pong ball into a bucket from various lengths and then there was the grand prize game and then there's sometime during there cookie would try to shove a, a whipped cream pie in bozo's face and bozo would always smack it back in his face and then they were always big on on spraying each other with seltzer water it was a, a you know this was in the 80s and it, it was a show that could have been pulled right out of the 50s archway cookies i think that's what it was i don't know where that came from archway cookies he would always hold the bag and hand them to the kids archway cookies yeah wow i might have to do some digging and see if i can find an episode of bozo the clown and just watch it you it would be terrible to watch um <clears throat> there were several several bozo the clowns um the one that i remember he did he, he he's he's passed and i want to say he passed from cancer late 90s early 2000s probably and he had a grandson i want to say mid to late 2000s who made it to a major league baseball roster and i don't remember the name i don't even know if he was good don't know anything about him but i remember um, that was a little side fact of him you know he was bozo the clown's grandson and i remember when i heard that I, I if i remembered his name i'm not a baseball fan but if i remembered that name i would have been like yep he's my number one fan i'm the number one fan he's the best player in all of baseball i don't care if his batting average was was 0.013 i would have been like he's, are you kidding me the one hit he did have it was probably the best hit ever oh he gets thrown out of first base all the time yeah but he's so close you know what i mean yeah bozo the clown cookie i was it was terrible wow the wgn kind of just made me nostalgic this case is ridiculous though i didn't know anything about it but that guy is a piece of garbage and i apologize for the salty language well, this is video 99. I'm going to end this here and I'm going to go looking for some Bozo the Clown clips. <laughs> I'm going to try to, I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen, it's not going to be, episode 100, if I do find them, it's not going to be a good episode. But I'm going to love it. I'm going to love every second of it. Oh, uh, it's so bad. I loved it. I used to watch Bozo the Clown and then Winnie the Pooh before I went to school Monday through Friday. I was young um used to watch that and then um on the weekends I, my mom would wake me up at like 5 50 a.m and i would run upstairs or wherever i was whatever place we lived in. i lived in in um one two three four five six I lived in six places by the time I was 14. I went to seven schools in 12 years. So, you know, uh, we moved a lot. My parents got laid off and um, in the 80s. And so we had this game. Um, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it before, but uh, we had to hide the Bronco from the repo man and we were really good. 
and eventually he found it but it took him like nine months but he even he was he was like you guys are really good you know I mean if if there were medals given out you guys definitely got gold and we're like oh, thanks bud we tried you know and he was like yeah proud of you guys but she'd wake me up I don't know how I just went off on that one but she'd wake me up and I would run upstairs and I would grab there would be several different cereal options out for me and I would grab one and I remember one of them that I would eat was nerd cereal I don't know if you've ever had a chance um, from what I remember vastly overrated um, but I would I would have some nerd cereal or some you know something go sit on the floor in front of the TV on my stomach and elbows like this and just be and I would just eat my cereal and 6 a.m. I was watching cartoons up until 10 o'clock I think like 8 30 there was like a an hour block of the greatest cartoon in the history of the world you know exactly what I'm gonna say TMNT Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I would watch that and then right after that was Pee Wee's Playhouse and that was when I knew okay after I watched Pee Wee because I did watch Pee Wee after I watched that it's time to cartoons are over because now it's the adult stuff you know movies and I remember we were going somewhere I, I, I got up I went and got ready because we were going to see a movie or something and I came downstairs the same channel was on and it might have been WGN and it was uh, like a Saturday at like noon and it was one of the throwback um, scary um, 70s violent um, I don't remember but anyways in this film man I got sidetracked big time on this but anyways in this film these two boys are at the circus and they go walking into this tent and they, they see these performers and the performers are like yeah come on into the tent and they go into the tent and it was a man and a woman and the the older boy stayed with the man and the man's just talking to him and he's just like so do you like being in the circus and da, da, da. and the woman takes a small boy and she she leads him down further down this area in the tent and they go in there and all of a sudden the boys like looking at outfits and he looks over and there's a mirror and he looks and he looks back like this and the guy standing behind him he looks in the mirror and the guy's not there and that's when he realizes this man's a vampire he's a circus vampire and then he turns around and the guy's teeth like are long and he's like <laughs> and it's like a 15 second <laughs> and the kid's like uh, uh, no and the vampire's like <laughs> And then he finally just grabs him and bites him. And then they fall behind some stuff out of frame. And the music's like, dun, 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 dun. And then you hear, ah. And the kid's like, my brother. And the when he looks, the woman's like, Kish. And he's like, huh? Oh, no. No. And she's like, Kish. And then she grabs him and sinks her teeth into him. And then they fall down and it's like dun 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 and I swear subtitles should have popped up and been like what did you expect was gonna happen like it was the same thing and I just remember watching that and then from that moment on <laughs> I could never sleep with my head turned at night because I was like a vampire could sneak in and bite me on the neck but like if I'm sleeping like this or I'm on my side like apparently he's just like mm, damn it I can't bite him no he's he, no he's he doesn't have his head turned I can't bite I have to turn the head and you know that's like that's I can't do that they're so strong <laughs> I don't know where I why I'm I, how I got here 
But anyways, I'm going to look for some Bozo the Clown episodes. That's going to be episode 100. I'm going to ruin a lot of people's day on this one. And it's going to be very exciting for me. <laughs> oh, well. Like and subscribe. Um, look, have a good day. Have a good night. I truly appreciate the... I have 81 subscribers, and I appreciate every one of you. And um, let's just keep it going. Thank you.